And this month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Super Inframan, Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, and Tim. Thank you so much for your incredible support. And tonight's show is presented with additional support from Nathaniel A. Giles' new book, Unpleasantness, Ghost Stories for the Depressed. Deceased workers haunt an office until management decisions erase all memory of them. A woman is driven into a life she never wanted by a vision of her future self. A man sees a ghost, but just for a second, and it ruptures his already distorted worldview. Unpleasantness reinvents the ghost story for the 21st century. Nine stories and 260 pages for just 99 cents. Available right now from Amazon.com and Kindle Unlimited. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have as my uh, co-hosts here, Christopher Ernst. Hello, everybody. And Super Inframan. Hey, everybody. Good to talk to you tonight. And uh, we're going to be doing listener stories because a number of people have been telling me they want another listener stories episode. Um, And I'm actually going to send this one out to Zuri Willis, who... uh, Runs the High Strangeness group on Facebook. I, I know these are usually her favorite shows. So she's been very supportive online of the shows. Uh, a bunch of the, you know, Strange Familiars, this one, and then all the other ones that we connect with. So I figure I'll give her a shout out to her for the for this type of a show. So there. Awesome. <laughs> she, start, she started awesome. a couple of groups. There's the High Strangeness group and there's another one, but I don't remember what the other one is off the top of my head. All right. You rock, sorry. Let's let's get to this one. Um Okay, so I'm never sure. I'm just going to leave names out for the most part. Okay. I'm writing in with a story of mine which happened to me when I must have been about 10. I was living in Amsterdam at the time where I was born and raised. Uh, I moved to the UK 3 plus years ago. I'm 29 now, so my story would take place around 2001. The story combines two weird events, which might be somehow related. What do I know? But in any case, they took place on the same night. I was in my bed, top bunk, my younger brother already asleep in the bed below me. Suddenly, I hear my aunt's voice. I don't remember now what she was talking about exactly in detail, but it was definitely about Christmas plans, and I was getting to, and it was getting to the end of the year. I ran into the living room to say hi to my aunt, who I thought was in the house because I could hear her so vividly, but it turns out it was just my mom sitting there. She had just hung up the phone. Now you're probably thinking, was the phone on speaker? And was I hearing that from my bedroom? And the answer is no. It was a pretty old 1980s looking black and red collared landline thing that had no speaker function. My mom asked me what I was doing out of bed and I told her I could hear my aunt and I pretty much word for word told her what my aunt had said. My mom was pretty freaked out. It was exactly what they had been talking about, but there's no way I could have overheard this conversation. I might have been able to hear my mom's side of the call, but typically from the bedroom, I couldn't hear what's going on in the living room anyway, so even that would have been exceptional, although mundane. Anyway, I get put back to bed, and somewhat excited about it all, I lay there for a bit, but eventually I did fall asleep. Then I remember being awake, and I've never been able to convince myself this was a dream, but perhaps it was. I'm sitting up in my bed looking at my left shoulder and there's this fleshy protrusion coming from it. it. Hollow, almost see-through. I can only describe it as a weird, elongated pimple. I wasn't freaked out as if it were a dream. At least it wasn't a nightmare. Uh, When I woke up again in the morning, there was nothing to see and I guess I just went to school or whatever. Years later, I got a scar on that shoulder and whenever I look at it, I'm reminded of that night, the sitting up in bed part and the phone call as well. Uh, He says, there is a way I can convey what this pimple looked like. It looked like a fleshy pink version of those potato sticks. He said, we don't, doesn't know if we have them in the U.S., but I have seen those. So that's, I mean, okay. So the first part of it, it sounds like he was just picking up on the information in the area, really. 
I don't know how better to explain that. I mean, I've had, I've had, I don't think I've ever had quite that experience, but it sounds like he was probably in a state where he was picking up more of what's going on in the environment, even though he couldn't actually hear it. Right. Was this, this was, uh, he said at bedtime or as he was going to bed, trying yeah. to go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. In that hypnagogic state. Yeah, you know, and I've come across uh, some folks that have had other sensory kind of uh, heightened experiences like that, where they've been looking down the road, and it's almost like their vision zoomed in or something like that. Right. Uh, with something that's, you know, 200 yards away for a moment, yeah. it looks like it's 10 feet in front of them. And so, yeah, and that's got to be another thing to your point about picking up information, because you just don't have the fidelity in your vision to see like that. Um, so that, that would make a lot of sense to me, actually. And the second part, I, would, I mean, the second part could almost be uh, a precognitive or retrocausal in the sense that he did end up with a scar there at some point. So maybe he was seeing, like, you know, information that was telling him, yeah, you know, you're eventually going to get an injury there. Yeah, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be really curious. That's the first thing I thought of is what the actual injury was and if there was any sort of, I don't know, the experience or the way in which they were injured had anything to do with sort of the shape or the feeling of that moment with yeah. the protrusion. You know, I, I guess this may be because I, I've been checking out uh, Jack Hunter after he was on the show last week. <laughs> but uh, I, I was thinking about uh, almost like – it seemed like he alluded to it being kind of transparent or something like that. That made me think of like a protoplasmic parasite, <laughs> to be honest. Huh. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and if you've got something like that, that's uh, real, but not real in the, the yeah. most literal sense, uh, you know, is that connected you to, to some other things that are acting as an antenna to pick up the other information that you got as well? Yeah, sure. Well, th that's, I mean, the idea of having some sort of astral parasite or like a yeah. spirit, I mean, and I'm talking about it specifically from that angle, there are sure many other angles you could talk about it, but it's one I'm most familiar with. Um, yeah, that's, it's very common and it's something that, you know, people are who experience, you know, astral travel or, you know, um, or, you know, engaging in that space, in that plane, um, it is something very real that they come across and that they work with. And even some people that don't do a lot of like astral body traveling, you know, have work trying to sort of shake off or, you know, exorcise, you know, parasites mm -hmm. of some kind, you know, there are different, different banishing rituals and different ways that people will do that um, in order to sort of, sh sh um, what's it, uh, slog off, I guess would be the word, <laughs> right. you know, or, or shake loose or exercise or, you know, whatever, you know, sort of way res resonates with you. And that definitely could have been uh, uh, something if it felt parasitic. Yeah. Well, he doesn't specify whether it does or not, um, and it didn't scare him. It did. He said it didn't feel nightmarish, so that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I don't know. Maybe he was just in the right state of mind where he was picking up more information from the environment than he normally would. His injury looked like a pimple that he would have in the future, and he hurt his aunt when he couldn't <laughs> have hurt her. So, anyway, it, it, and, I could definitely see being kind of trapped or or have that moment where you find yourself bridging into. You know, you mentioned hypnagogic, Chris, that astral type aspect and picking up on the information and something stopping by to say hi and hanging out in the shoulder for a little bit, you know. <laughs> uh, it was the spirit of his aunt long after she died coming back in time <laughs> to perch yeah. on his shoulder. And that's why he could also hear her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, this next one. uh Okay, so the first one I was six or seven years old for. I was on a hiking trip with a church group that was kind of like Boy Scouts, and my dad was in charge of it. So the group split in two at one point, and then later myself and another boy wanted to check out something, so we were given permission and went off. The trails were pretty easy in the area, and we weren't far from the cars, so getting lost shouldn't have been an issue, but somehow we did get lost. And right about the time that I'm really about to freak out, I start to hear someone calling my name in the distance. We run down the trail toward the voice, and we come around a bend to see people on horseback. There was a woman, who was the person calling my name, and a man in flannel, looking bored, and a girl who looked to be between 12 and 14. The woman asked if I was Marcus Moore, and I said yes, and she tells me my dad is looking for me, which made no sense to me. I asked how to find him, and she points down a trail to the parking lot. 
So we get back to the cars, and I see my dad, who doesn't look worried at all, and I ask if he was looking for me, and he told me they had just gotten back about 10 minutes ago. Then I ask about the people on horses, and he has no idea what I'm talking about. We tell him, and the other guy's dad's the whole story. The, uh, the other dad said kind of in a coy way it may have been an angel. I felt like he was patronizing me at this point. Anyway, I don't know if it was an angel or what, but the craziest part is the woman knew my name, and that's the part I can't rationalize. Hmm. So it, it, you know, I don't know how weird it is that they got lost. You know, like did they get lost because something you know threw them off? Did they get lost just because they didn't actually know where they were? But uh, the the fact that one of the people's wearing flannel stands out, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking flannel man immediately. Uh, have you guys ever come across, uh, is it the gray man? I'm trying to think of the the name for this apparition or whatever, but it would show up at a, at a particular coast when a storm was coming in that would wipe out the houses that were built close to the coastline and things like that. Oh. So if you saw the gray man, you were supposed to evacuate the area because he was uh, essentially there to warn you that something bad was coming to happen. Uh, and, you know, there's always that story of, I couldn't tell you what it was, but obviously he had lived there and been alive at some point and had died in a storm or huh. some type of folklore like that. But, you know, it'd be great to know where the park was that they were in. And, you know, if there's a connection between the horse family to that area and, uh, you know, left behind something that uh, has a bit of a guardian aspect to it. Yeah. It could have also been a, it could have been something that people would identify as an angel as well, you know? Oh yeah. Some kind Absolutely. of guardian spirit, whatever that was just there to hey, get back, go that way, you know? Yeah. So it was it was a, a woman. Did she, did the person describe what the besides the flannel person, the flannel the flannel man? Nope. Uh, did the other descriptions of the other two? It was just a younger woman no, just, and then an older woman? There was a woman who was calling my name, a man in flannel looking board and a girl who looked to be about 12 to 14. Huh? Interesting. So a very normal looking group of people, really, when you think about it. Yeah. You know, uh, I've got a good friend of mine that you'll laugh at this. He's uh, my boxing coach, but, uh, he'll, we were visiting one time and, uh, he would talk about how sometimes, He's quite religious. Uh, angels will appear in your life, and you never know that they are. Right. Because they're there to not be recognized or be shown or make a scene. And so how would you do something like that to make it as innocuous as possible to, you know, for those two kids not to be afraid and go, oh, okay, whatever. So you've got yeah. one guy that looks very bored, and you've got a woman that knows his name and a kid. and So you wouldn't question it immediately and just like, okay, I'll go this way and avoid <laughs> potentially whatever was ahead. Right. Or, or getting more lost. Right. 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 It does remind me too of, you know, stories that I heard about, um, uh, the way that, uh, you know, different sort of spiritual agents would work in, um, both Vedic and uh, Sufi traditions, um, mm -hmm. uh, these types of, uh, sort of spirits called, uh, Abdals and, um, uh, was Abdal, uh, and, uh, Advan, I think, or that I'm probably messing up the names, but anyway, there are these spirits that essentially are like they're they're kind of like part of a control system <laughs> to borrow from Valley, uh, uh -huh. in that they are like they're making little minor like butterfly wing adjustments to things to sort of keep uh, nature from destroying itself almost, uh -huh. you know. Uh, and I'm saying this in a very you know uh, um, simplistic way, uh, interpreting interpreting these sort of myths um but it definitely jibes with that idea of the sort of i guess in less of a, a yeah the the, the uh, would be the mundane guardian angel something too that's definitely part of i think contemporary christianity um uh though you know in a, sort of a different in a different way and and i i made the comment uh during the uh last week's penny royal episode that I mean, it could be that we experience things like poltergeist activity regularly and never notice. And you could apply that too to spirits. Right. How many right. how many things do we encounter that aren't what we think they are, but they look exactly like what we would expect? Right. So we never we never think twice about it. Yeah, you, know, you see a plane fly overhead, you don't think, oh, maybe it's not a plane. 
because that leads you down a path of, of pretty crazy paranoia after a while. But, sure. I mean, John Keel has pointed out, you know, encounters where people would see a plane flying way slower than it could have without making any noise. There was, you know, and obviously there was something not right about it. Yeah. So how many times do these things mimic stuff that is going on and we just don't know it's a mimic? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That was actually one of the, the uh, one of the, and I can't remember which particular name it was, but one of those spirits uh, that I was just mentioning um, might have been a different one that it would name like Afsuni or something like that, particularly was a changeling. And that was its particular power and that it can appear sort of in any form. And it was it does that so that it is able to, you know, sort of very uh, subtly and um, transparently influence things without, you know, causing a big, I'm a... You know, I'm an angel with a million eyeballs and I'm flaming, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which might cost a little more problem than it's worth, you know. That, if that it was always those guys. <laughs> if, you, if you want to scare the people, that's the way to go. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this guy had a second second part to this. Said, the other thing is when I was in my 20s, I was working at a pizza place as a delivery driver dishwasher. My best friend growing up was the shift manager. Myself, him, and this other guy there got to be good friends after a while, and my job got to the point where I could wash dishes and let my mind wander. At some point, I'm not sure exactly when, I would start to hear my buddy calling back that there was a delivery. I would stop washing dishes, grab a delivery bag, and go up front, and he's just taking the pizza out of the oven and says he didn't call me yet. At first, I shrugged it off. Maybe I was just expecting it, so I heard something that wasn't there uh, before, it, you know, what that wasn't there happen. But it started happening all the time. I started to ask if he thought about it, uh, and he said he had. So I figured I was he was probably broadcasting, and I was picking up on it. It would happen with, with either one of my friends at the oven. It also happened the other way around a couple of times. It kind of seems crazy to me how when something is happening, you don't really it doesn't really seem as crazy as it would coming from someone else. I also tend to trip people out with cold re reading, but I think I pay attention more than most people. Uh, so I don't think there's anything out of the ordinary there. It's just kind of a party trick. So I had a friend, and I've talked about this before, where I could literally hear questions she was going to ask me before she asked them. Sure. And I didn't know that. And it, like I would just hear her voice ask a question, and I'd answer her, and she'd just look at me and go, I didn't ask yet. <laughs> <laughs> And I've never had it happen with anyone else, but I, uh, from having that experience, I don't doubt this experience at all because it sounds like the same basic thing. Like they were just in, uh, they connected well enough that that information was was moving there telekinetically. And how long or telepathically? Did, did, he say, did he say how long that he was was working with uh, the guy there? Uh, how long they've been working together. I'm just wondering, because I know that like from having both worked in kitchens and also worked, uh, and also played in bands and, uh, you know, they're similar in the sense that you're, you know, with a personal, uh, trying to, uh, accomplish something together and you have to work as a team. Um, and I actually had sort of similar experiences. Um, you really do get into a space either, you know, I remember cooking on the line with this guy, Simon, who was a friend of mine. And we were like, we would get in this zone where we really were communicating without talking to one another. Yeah. Um, uh, and it wasn't that I was necessarily hearing his what he was saying. Um, in this case, maybe that was actually how it was manifesting. But I definitely feel like people who are in this, in a collaborative effort that is not like non-linguistic, um, like cooking together or, uh, you know, being in a band together where you're playing music, that is a way that you can start to develop these, you know, um, other ways of communicating, um, non-verbal ways of communicating. And it really could even start with just the micro ticks, you know, and the, you know, micro gestures that we do and all that stuff that scientists like to talk about. Um, but it could go even further into, you know, talking about how things work in sort of a Sheldrake morphogenetic field, you know, ESP uh, space. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't say how long they, they worked together. He just said it had been a while and they had become good friends. Then that, yeah, that's so, that and it, since it went back and forth too, that's really cool. Uh, I mean, I hope that was a, a good experience too, because I know it's it was something that I enjoyed, like working with this guy Simon. You know, it was like yeah. 
we were kind of, even though we were like, you know, whatever 19 year olds, you know, doing fry cooking and stuff like that. It was like being able to be simpatico with a person like that can be a really interesting um, experience. And, and I also said telekinetic when I meant to say telepathic. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I love that, that it was working both ways when they would change out roles too. Yeah. So that kind of gives the implication that there was something deeper going on there. And size studies have shown in labs that that when you're uh, that you have uh, more of an effect sending like messages to friends tele- telepathically than people you don't know. Yeah, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So it does, it does. But they've actually you know shown shown that to be the case. So, <laughs> all right. So this next one happened in 20, 2019. Uh, it's a little bit long. Okay, we'll just start off with the setting. This happened on the day of Halloween in 2019, which I find to be slightly comical, if anything. At the time, I was studying in a depressing city in the east of my country. I knew nobody there, and I'm painfully bad at anything social-related because I grew up in lonely conditions. It was normal for me to go an entire day without speaking to anyone and even saying anything at all. I hated this city. It was gray and dead and depressing. Imagine everything that's bad about a city. A lot of cars, worn-down people... Brutalist architecture, general feeling of soullessness, and god-awful politics. It was not a good place for me to be mentally, especially since I was 300 kilometers away from my hometown and I had a commune or had a commute every week. I remember that on Halloween, as the days started getting darker and the ambience was quite special, uh, you know that Halloween ambience, and there was some wind outside that made me want to go do something on that special day. After coming home from my college classes, I dropped off my bag at my apartment, suited up, and headed outside. I didn't know where I really wanted to go, but I just knew I wanted to go somewhere. This was roughly roughly around 1800, that is 6 p.m., and it was kind of dusk already. I was new in the area. It was on the outskirts of my city where I had barely, ex- I was on the outskirts of my city where I had barely explored before, so I just kind of started walking. I went through many suburban streets before crossing a grassy field, still kind of in the city, and then I passed something slightly weird. It was like a very, very small forest, the size of a parking, I assume parking lot or so, small enough you'd see through it, and as I passed it on my right, I noticed a single bare mattress there on the ground. I didn't think much of it, and I'm not sure if it's worth including, but I got weirded out by it. There was no one else around. Anyways, I kept walking randomly through the neighborhood and eventually left the city proper and went to walk up a road in the forest that went up into a mountain. I think everyone knows those dark, curvy forest roads. At this point, I had walked like 15 kilometers already, which is not too much for me. I kept following the road and it split off. One side was still the kind of big road that crossed the mountain and led into another valley. I went to the left, basically a U-turn into a small dirt path. This one's also kind of weird, but not... not really because it was sectioned off and had government signs on it that said to stay away because the area was dangerous. I hopped that barrier like a bunny and kept going, but eventually remembered all sorts of reasons I should be in my apartment and headed back. The long walk was mostly uneventful. I came back into my apartment and locked the door as I always do and took off some clothes. There was almost nothing in my apartment save two wooden benches, one wooden table, my studying supplies, my clothes, a black plastic trash bag in a corner, a mattress on the floor, and a few other things. The layout of my apartment is as follows. There's one area you can't really call a room that serves as the in-between for my main room, my bathroom, and the outside. I'm on the third floor. To the right would be my bathroom, and straight ahead in the main room with all the items I've described, plus a boiler and a makeshift kitchen. It's important to understand the location of my mattress and the black trash bag. My mattress is placed in a rectangular space where it just barely fits. Now, the way I was usually laying on this mattress, my head would touch the wall behind, which would be in the in-between area. My feet would touch the wall. Uh, my feet would, would touch the wall behind, which would be the neighbor's apartment. Okay, I see how he wrote that. And to my left would be the wall, which would be the third floor hallway outside that connected to the apartments. All the walls are white. I would be able to see only a part of the two big room from my right, including the benches and table, but would not be able to see the area directly to your right when you enter the room from the in-between area. This would include the boiler, the crappy student kitchen, and the plastic bag, which I used as a trash bag in a corner. So I took a shower. He says, can you imagine that I had no shower curtain? 
Um, prepared for another bleak day tomorrow and got into my, quote, bed. It's usual for me to hear the plastic bag rustle a bit after laying down in the silent apartment. I'd throw something in there and it would slowly crumple back down under its own weight, even tens of minutes after having touched it last. It's a small noise, and that is what I heard at first. Just the bag making a bit of noise. So I waited it out because you can probably never completely shake that nervous feeling you get in those situations. There were at least two small, weird noises, which I tried to ignore. Remember, I'm laying there mostly naked and immobile on the mattress. I waited out. What I hear then is something punch the plastic bag. Not violent and not too much into the contents of the bag. Imagine you had an empty plastic bag and you kick or punch it. That's what I heard. There's no way that it would have been just the plastic falling back into itself, even if it was a moderately large bag. So now I'm very immobile. And I listen. One of my typical reactions to such phenomena is not to panic or interfere immediately. I lay there and think about how I could have possibly or how it could have possibly made such a noise. Eventually, I just can't get it out of my head. I stand up. I flip the switch on the headside wall, narrow my eyes because of the light and go take a look. The bag is still where it was. It doesn't look disturbed or anything. I play with it for a while and conclude that only a slap or punch would have made such a noise. I realized that if any entity is watching me right now, it knows that I know. I decide to play dumb and go lay back down and remain there for a while. It is at this point that he writes, a freaky invisible cloud of weight produces a disembodied zombie moan and lays down on top of my legs. The first thing I heard was the moan and not in a sexual type of moan, like more like a moan of weakness. Like someone is sick. The voice was probably male and higher pitched. I barely have time to think what the F is going on and uh, that I feel something that is best described as a cloud of weight that is not defined. Like imagine the distinction between sharp and blurry, not too heavy, something I could lift with ease, come down softly, get into contact with my legs and then sink into them a bit. The term blurry weight is approximate because I didn't feel as if there was a beginning point of contact it was more like a transition it would be hard to measure it laid down mostly on my right leg but kind of centered too it produced two moans one when it was laying down and then it was just kind of there and when when it was just kind of there i imagine you've probably had a cat lay down on top of you while you were in bed in your life and you can't move or anything because the darn cat occupies your legs well my situation in my situation it was a ghost And I also can't move, not because it's not possible, mind you. It's not sleep paralysis. I barely laid down. I was completely conscious and could move. I kind of just didn't want to. Uh, Eventually, I don't remember if I slightly moved or not, but I just drifted off to sleep. The next day, my alarm clock rings. It was a song ironically titled Nightmare Begins uh, from a game called Neverending Nightmares. And it woke me up for a new crappy day. I put it all in the back of my mind and didn't care much about it because I thought it wasn't important. I studied and everything and came back to the apartment in the evening. And as I prepared to sleep again, I recalled the the events of my previous night. My feelings toward it had been mostly neutral. I know that sounds like a pity party already, but most of my feelings are kind of gone. As I was laying there, it happened again, this time with lesser intensity. There is one memory that I have of the thing that I find quite peculiar I don't recall when it was exactly, but it must have been after the first night. I probably woke up in the night, and I was facing the wall behind, which is the third floor hallway. I remember that my back, in my back, I heard a faint but distinctive voice. It clearly said the equivalent for hello in my language. Once at first, and then a second time. And here's the interesting part. I absolutely recall that on the second time that it said hello, there was a noise that most of us do. The sound that makes me think of a saliva bubble popping, like when you talk in a wet way. It's not easy to describe, but it's usually on letters such as B or F. In this case, the word had a B in it, and that's where the distinctive noise occurred. At the time, I immediately realized that this was important info that I had gathered, and so I made sure to store it in the back of my mind. I guess it worked because I recall it. The activity would keep going on for the next few days, maybe a week or two, and at some point manifested as a force that would try to forcibly put me to sleep whenever I would wake up at night. Back then, I was going for an out-of-body experience, and the interference of an unknown in the process was annoying. At some point, I felt the weight try to 
tried to take hold of my chest. I paused all out-of-body attempts then. Interestingly, I had written, you can haunt this room if you want to with a pencil on a paper in English. I later crossed it out and things gradually stopped happening. I still have pictures and video of the apartment somewhere, but I never tried EVPs as I was playing dumb. I recall one of the rules of par paranormal being don't feed it attention. I don't know what it was and thus concluded it was probably better to put up a wall of non-interaction. Um, in the aftermath, he says, I remember telling a person I know that I hold dear. She's kind of like you in that she's had a whole mountain of experiences. And when I finally told her after hyping up in text messages, she was kind of disappointed and told me stuff like that happens to her all the time. I guess it's not anything to be proud about. She's a person that is troublesome for me because I feel that I'm a real letdown to her. And yet I, I like her. She just makes me feel guilty. She realized some sort of potential in me when I was a teenager. And many years later, I'm still worthless and wasted it all. You've also talked about poltergeist phenomena on your show. I guess it was a liminal time in my life. I was also letting go... I was also letting myself go with depression and alcohol, so I think that helped. And interestingly, I have also had quite a bit of trauma in my life and mostly kept it repressed in the back of my mind. I have to. I've also had some other experience when I was a teenager, which included shadow figures seen during the day. I've had one prophetic dream about a place I've never been to and some synchronicities. Probably almost opened my third eye once and heard a weird voice speak in a strange language inside of a chimney but I can't make sense of it all. Being lost in life probably adds to the liminality. I wish there was more fun in my life, and it seems to equate, I seem to equate fun with weirdness, even just to feel special or like my life means something. But when the weirdness happens, I don't actually want it anymore. Hmm. So that's, that's a creepy story. Yeah. Um, I've had, I've definitely had the ghost cat experience where I felt things jump on my bed, but never had anything like moan and lay on top of me like that, unless yeah, it was a sleep paralysis incident. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a pretty scary, um, experience to have. I mean, it does. I, I, I agree with his friend in terms of my experiences and people that I know, um, not, not to dismiss, but to say, yeah, this is something that's uh, that is very common, um, particularly you know at a time when uh, everything going on around you is liminal. Like they were saying, if you had these experiences before, you know when you were younger, uh, or at least a sensitivity that means that you're aware in some way of uh, spirits or non-physical entities. Um, and I think that you know. One of one of the ways, one of the models that I uh, had come across um, in how spirits work, and this is particularly in terms of how spirits work uh, with people who uh, committed suicide, is this concept that uh, the people who did commit suicide still have to work out like the karma that they had. Uh, that was sort of in there for the rest of their their prescribed lives, and mm. that their those little sort of bits of karma, those the impressions, they still need to somehow work out before they can move on. Uh, and again, this is just one model that I came across and looking through things, um, and that uh, because of that, a lot of the uh, what we see in the physical world as uh, exorcism or and not exorcisms, but as uh, uh, possessions um, or obsessions of some kind or spirit interactions where the spirit is sort of uh, wanting something from you is the spirit essentially trying to work out that karma. And a lot of it's very mundane things like, you know, smoking a cigarette or, or stuff like that. Um, and so a lot of times when people experience it, uh, it is it is this kind of, you know, a spirit trying to almost like ride you so that they can experience, can experience this this thing and then kind of let it go. Uh, supposedly, it's not harmful, um, but it can be, you know, very disturbing. And if it's something that, you know, you're going through a difficult time, can be, be very disturbing, particularly if, you know, this person or the spirit has been around for a very long time. Uh, because I, I, it was said that, you know, the longer spirits are sort of around in this state, 
sort of waiting to go on to the next space, they become that consciousness becomes more and more distorted. And so that can either be something that becomes malevolent or it can be something which is simply, um, you know, weird and odd and scary because the spirits, um, the, the longer these spirits are sort of in this limbo space trying to work out the karma, the more distorted it can become. Um, and uh, the more distorted that consciousness can become through, you know, sitting there full of rage, you know, wanting to work out this karma uh, or whatever trauma is left over, um, that can become something that either uh, is malevolent or something that is simply uh, scary because it is distorted, even though it has no malevolent purpose. It's simply trying to work out that karma. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that being like a, an intention personified when you get to a certain level of that degradation, Chris. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Uh, well, funky geez. old duplex. And uh, it's where I, I had a lot of my, my weirder uh, shadow people experiences and things like that. But uh, when he was talking about waking up and feeling like he was forced back to sleep, uh, I had that happen to me a lot where I get disturbed. You know, you would see the, the shadow person and then you would feel like sleep was so heavy on you, even though you were fighting to wake up. And that's a very hypnagogic state, I suppose. But uh, I don't know. It, it, it made me think of that. And then, of course, there's also that whole, excuse me, the old hag aspect of it, too. The tag aspect? The whole the, uh, the old hag. That was uh, oh, old uh, hag. Okay, I think you said tag. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, true. It, hag, it, 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 it does have the old hag sort of thing. I'm also wondering, I mean, he was obviously very depressed at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, and all that stress, depression, and everything else, if it projects outwards, I mean, I would think a sort of zombie ghost is exactly what would project. <laughs> Right, right. It would come like, oh, that smells good. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, isn't that like if he felt really depressed? What did he say? It was like a gray cloud that went like, oh. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So maybe, maybe he was creating sort of this, this, this was the exp like a poltergeist expression of sure. his depression and ah. his malaise and everything, just kind of like, and it just showed up like that because it needed an outlet. Where was, does he say what city this was in? No. Or is it, is that, okay. Mm. No, he, he didn't want to say what city it was or anything. No, no, no problem. It, it, it's, mm. it's not, not in the U S yeah, not in the U S I'd just be curious just to, you know, if I'm thinking about spirits that are left over, sort of how old the city was. Oh yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh. I don't know. I kind of like the poltergeist idea because just because the thing sounds like yeah. a, a depression poltergeist, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're totally right, right about right. that. So, but uh, my luck, I would have a depression poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably do. I, I I would say don't you know to this guy don't don't let people dismiss your experiences. I mean, just because yeah. other people have experienced things like it doesn't mean that it's not an interesting experience. You know. Right. And even, yeah, being, being, if your friend says it's commonplace and even if it is, which, you know, I have heard of other people that have it by no means, just that mean it's not significant. I mean, I think that all of these experiences and one of my own personal feelings about the experience of the occult or the experience of the anomalous is that it is something that in many ways is very personal and that's why it's sort of so hard for us to, you know, get our hands around it. And maybe there's some things happening that, you know, aren't that maybe there are some nuts and bolts things that are happening ETs and otherwise, but um, a lot of the stuff that I do think is, you know, working in a very um, uh, working that is working through occult purposes or occult means. Um, and I say that in the very broadest sense of what occult uh, stands for um, are very personal experiences that, uh, you know, mean a lot to you um, and can, like, depending on how much you want to sort of lean into that experience, if you're interested in kind of exploring yourself, I think that these are opportunities, these can be opportunities for that. Not that I think it's very uh, easy to do. I think it's very difficult, obviously, to, you know, uh, uh, to, to lean into one's own psyche and try to explore there. Um, but I think that if you're having experiences like these, it could possibly be something that is, you know, giving you a window by which you can uh, try to deal with even some of the trauma and depression that you were talking about um, in very effective ways. I think people who work in, in this space 
with those types of uh, uh, with those types of um, with those types of issues that they're having, uh, I think that working in sort of a metaphysical occult space can be very beneficial. I know a lot of people that have benefited a lot from it. Agreed. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, when I was in my 20s having those shadow people experiences, it was right after my father passed away, and I was quite depressed for a few years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I, I totally think that was connected. Uh, one other thing I would add to that, too, um, you know, it might be worth this time to go back and kind of survey some of his experiences and see if there's other thing that's happened that he's disregarded or forgotten about or brushed aside. Uh, because, you know, we've all talked about this. If you have a few experiences, you've probably had a lot more. You just may have brushed it off at the moment or, you know, swiped it away as, oh, that's not really what I saw or that's not really what happened. But it, it's worth revisiting and you may find out that uh, a lot more strange stuff has happened to you. True. True. All right. The next one's pretty short and uh, connects to the uh, sh show I did months ago uh, where I was talking about how we kept seeing these, these really large flies. And then I found out those flies don't really <laughs> exist here. Right. And uh, so this person says, I live in the UK. 15 years ago, I moved from a busy town with my husband and two sons to a small village. It was summertime. On moving day, we arrived at the new house, and the old lady we bought it from was in the house waiting for us to arrive. We found her just standing in the kitchen. That's a bit weird because whenever we've moved to a house before, the previous occupants were not there to greet us. She said she hoped we'd be happy in the house and left. Once she had gone, I opened a kitchen cupboard, and a swarm of flies flew out. Every cupboard in the kitchen was full of flies and soon filled the kitchen. We had to go out and buy bug-killing chemicals to get rid of them. We were plagued with huge numbers of flies all that summer. We have never seen so many flies any year since. They weren't particularly huge flies. There were just so many. There was no rotting food in the kitchen. All the cupboards were spotlessly clean, as, as was the whole house. Why they were just in the cupboards when we arrived, I don't know. The previous occupants also left a besom broom pr pushed up into the attic rafters. Not sure what that was about. It's still actually there because I'm not sure if I should move it. Anyway, not as interesting as some of the other stories you get, but still weird. We've had occasionally other odd experiences here, but nothing consistent. And the first thing I think is, did this some woman somehow fill her, her things with flies as like a prank? But I mean, yeah. how would you even do that? I don't know if you were a really good like uh, entomologist and you could plant the uh, larvae so that they would yeah i mean I'm, I'm just kidding you could probably do it that way but who would right it's a, it's a, and of course it yeah. kept up all summer too yeah what i a, mean what a, go ahead go ahead chris no i was gonna say i mean as last time i think as I, I think i was on that show when we talked about the flies i am at a loss i do not know um uh so yeah saxon go ahead well you know uh it always makes me think of like uh, the Green Mile or something like that. Uh, hordes of flies freak me out, put it mildly. But uh, you know, I, I I think about like transmutation and old alchemical ideas and things like that. I had a uh, lady that used to watch me when I was very small, babysitter, and she was one of those people that thought if you took horse hair, like from a horse's tail, and put it into a trough, the horse hair would turn into a worm you know and uh there's there's no rhyme or reason to any of that but uh it, it's such a strange thing you know we don't know the history on the house i guess if food was going to cause a problem maybe there had been old food in the cupboard at some point uh but man i don't know it, that's pretty fascinating to me because i'm like y'all that makes no sense yeah yeah well, and, and after I did the show talking about the flies and stuff, I mean, a bunch of people, we finally figured out they were timber flies, but timber flies don't exist here. Um, and then my house got completely swarmed with flies, and I've never had that happen before. I mean, it's it, in terms of it as sort of a symbol, it's classic. You know, it is the swarm of flies. I think of Beelzebub. You know, right, I think right. of the infestations and plagues. And I mean, how many depictions have we seen of demons?
situations, uh, you know, in films and stuff like that and in media where they have like flies buzzing all over them. So it's a very powerful symbol. I mean, whatever, whatever it might come from, I guess that's where I'm at a loss. I, I can't. Yeah. Uh, where, you know, both paranormal, I mean, paranormal, paranormally, who knows, um, uh, in terms of actual flies, how it would get there. I do not know unless there were like, yeah, maggots that were in the walls or something. Well, true. But again, how would the maggots get in the walls generally? I mean, you don't, right. you don't see that. That's not a normal thing you see. Yeah. No. Nope. Right. And if you do see that, you probably shouldn't buy the house. <laughs> That's why they were all in the cupboards. Right. Unless you're really metal and you want, like, maggots in my walls. <laughs> uh, all right. This next one's from Nev. Uh, okay. So this is a rather long story and a little complicated since it spans two generations and quite a few years. It's also been quite a few years since the events I described happened, so bear with me if some of the events, especially the early ones, seem vague. When I was around five years old, my mom... Dad and myself would vacation in a tiny cottage near the coast of Cornwall in the UK. The way the cottage was laid out, you could enter. You would enter via the kitchen. The kitchen led through to a lounge living area, and at the back of the lounge was a set of stairs leading up to the only bedroom. My parents shared a double bed, and I slept in a small fold-up bed at the end of their bed and right next to the stairs, separated from the stairway by only a wooden stair rail. Being a child, I went up to bed before my parents, who were directly downstairs, I believe, watching TV. I'm not certain if I was woken up from sleep or if I hadn't fully drifted off to sleep yet, but I'm certain that I was awake for this event and did not dream it. I was facing away from the stairs, facing towards my parents' bed, when something made me turn and look through the stair rails. Right on the other side of the rails, only a foot or so away from my face, was a figure that was not one of my parents. It was a solid white, not translucent, and appeared to be wearing some sort of robes or a dress. I could only see it from the torso up, given my position, as though it was standing halfway up the stairs. I don't recall its exact facial features, though I have the feeling that if, I, if it did have any, they were vague and simply the outlines of eyes, nose, and mouth. It seemed to be looking directly at me. The strangest thing about it was the shape of its head. As strange as it sounds, the outline of its head looked like Lisa Simpson's hair. Large, thick spikes around the top and sides, and its face like some sort of halo. I can't say for certain what this this what vibe this entity was giving off, because all I remember was being terrified. But this may have just been because, as a child, I didn't know how else to react to the situation. I leapt out of bed, ran to the light switch, and turned on the lights. The figure vanished as though it had gone back down the stairs. I screamed and cried for my parents, who came up quickly to find out what was happening. And they soothed me and got me back to sleep. Weirdly, I don't remember this visitation making me dislike the cottage or feel uncomfortable there, since I otherwise have very fond memories of the place. I didn't really think of the event until many years later, when I was in my teens and talking with my dad about strange paranormal events in our lives. He admitted to me then that he, when I had described to him the entity I saw at the cottage on that night all those years ago, a chill ran down his spine. He then told me of how when he was about five, year old, five years old himself, he had seen not one, but two of those same entities. Back when he was younger, it was common for siblings and bigger families to share beds, often top to tail, where one would sleep with their head at one end while the other slept with their head at the other. He shared a room with his two brothers, one of whom had his own bed and the other uh, who shared the bed with my dad. Something woke him up like he can't remember exactly what woke him up, and saw two figures exactly like the one I described. One was at the foot of his brother's bed, and one was the foot of his shared bed. Panicked, he tried desperately to wake up the brother next to him. As he describes it, as his brother gained consciousness, the figures seemed to fade into the wardrobe in the room. So it turns out that both me and my father saw the same thing at about the same age in two very different places years and miles apart. The logical explanation would be that when my dad was younger, he dreamt of those entities, and when I was younger, I somehow overheard him talking about the encounter and had the same sort of dream myself. Only my dad swears he never mentioned the sighting when I was a child and didn't even tell me about it until many years after my own encounter, which seem with seemingly the same entity. Neither of us have seen the entity in the flesh again. But wait, the story doesn't end there, and it gets stranger. Fast forward to my mid-teens, and my dad and I are visiting a friend of his who lives in London for a weekend city break. 
Said friend is quite well off and collects artwork and historical pieces that take his fancy. He wanted to show us a few pieces from his collection and brings out a few pottery figurines. The figurines are all different, seemingly or seeming to come from different parts of the world and time periods, and all seem to have been broken, perhaps deliberately in some way. Most are interesting, but not particularly noteworthy, until we come across one figure that had its head broken off from its body and reattached. The figure le- figurine looked exactly like the figures both my dad and I had seen, right down to the strange head shape on the figurine, and uh, what looked more obviously like a crown or halo than it had on the entities themselves. My dad becomes visibly unnerved and tells our friend about our encounter with the beings in the figurine resembled. The friend offers to give him the figurine, but my dad refuses, saying that it'll make him very uncomfortable and he wouldn't want it in the house. We do, however, take some photos of it. Friend only then admits that after obtaining the figures, or the figurines, he'd had a string of bad luck, including his flat flooding and an infestation of rats. We leave London before we get a chance to develop the photos we took of the figurine. This was in the days of disposable cameras with film you had to take into a store to get developed. But keep them with the intention of taking them to the London Museum and hopefully finding finding someone who could identify the figurine and where it came from. The next chance we get, we decide to head back to London, take the pictures to the museum and make a day of it. This does not go as planned. On the motorway heading to London, we're almost hit by a van that was merging from a slipway and about crashed into the side of us. When we get to London, despite following all the road signs and having been to the museum on several occasions, we absolutely cannot find our way to the museum and eventually give up after the the attempt becomes more and more frustrating. We never did get the photos to the museum or anyone who might be able to help identify the figurine. I'm sorry that there isn't a satisfying end to this story. Neither myself or my father have any idea or explanation for what these entities might have been or how, if indeed at all, the potentially cursed figurine that we would never, could never identify was connected to the sightings beyond its resemblance. Neither of us have ever seen the entities since. I'm sure the photos of the figurine we, that we took are somewhere, but I have no idea where. If I ever find them, I will send them to you. Um, that's far from my, my or my family's only paranormal experience, but it's the one I find the most peculiar. If anyone, uh, if you or anyone in the comments has any idea what this would be, or what this is, has any ideas about this, that's what it is, I would really love to hear them. So guys, what do you think? Wow. Um, <laughs> no pictures. All right. Describe what, it, what what's the, the description again, the specific description of the, the figure. Well, it was, I think that was, yeah, it was trans. It was white, but not translucent. Uh, let me go up here. It, like it was, it was in a robe. Yeah. It was solid, right. solid white, not translucent. It appeared to be wearing some sort of robes or dress. Although I could only see it from the torso up given my position. I don't recall its exact facial features, though I have the feeling that if I did, they were vague and simply the outlines of eyes, nose, and mouth. It seemed to be yeah. looking directly at me. Uh, the shape of its head was like Lisa Simpson hair, large, thick, black <laughs> spikes. But then later in seeing the uh, uh, the shard of the uh, whatever the archaeological piece was, that seemed to be a crown is what right. they said. Yeah. It's really interesting. What a great story. Um, yeah, I I mean, the crown is certainly something interesting. Uh, there are, you know, numerous depictions that, you know, would have a crown, but everything else it, is a little too nebulous. Um, you know, maybe a smarter, which is pretty much everybody uh, out there, a smarter person would be able to come up with something. But it's, it's almost too sort of generic and vague at this point. Hmm. It's it's interesting because it, it it seems very paranormal, but then it also reminds me of some of the hallmarks of abduction experiences too, where you have that mm-hmm. generational sure. aspect. Um, you know, the fact that the figure, of course, honestly, seeing it reproduce as a figurine actually makes me think that uh, almost more the sense of a, an abduction experience because uh, maybe that happened to somebody else in the past as well. And that was their way of recording it. Um, it's really hard to say, but I, I don't know. You know, I, I've been very big lately on looking back at people that uh, think they've had a religious experience where they've woken up and seen a glowing figure in the room or a solid figure like this. And I'm like, man, all of those 
carry those same like set of details in a certain way. And uh, if you were just trying to look at someone, if we were going to go back to the nuts and bolts side of things, like their genetics, then you only have to, you know, see the uh, parent one time, then the child one time, then the next generation one time to get a copy of their DNA, if that was it. But uh, I think it's far deeper than that, of course. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't get past this, uh, uh, the, the, the figurine from antiquity. I really how how old they didn't say how old no. the friend said it was. No, they didn't know anything about it. Apparently, that is going to drive me crazy because <laughs> you know I I mean immediately the thing that comes to mind is that this is some sort of you know a depiction of a specific spirit or a specific demon or a specific entity from uh, some specific you know lore or myth or legend or grimoire um, uh, and it would be you know really interesting to to know about that and then to maybe know a little bit about. You know, if I were to be investigating this, I guess I would look into your genealogy, too, um, uh, to see, you know, if there's any way you can figure out if it goes back and other people in your family, you know, from your father's line have seen uh, or experienced anything like this. Um, yeah, that's one line I would go through. And then I also might look, you know, if you do come from a particular um, uh culture that has been passed down through generations if you know within the the myth and folklore and legend of that if there are any figures that might look like this but i am sure that's something that this listener has already probably explored if they were going to be taking it to museum yeah i, uh, I think that was a great idea go ahead sorry i'm sorry no go ahead i was gonna say i think it was a great idea they they were taking it to the museum uh one thing i would you know, add to Chris's comments too. Uh, you know, I, my grandfather had this experience where he was going to a particular lake at night. He was actually going to go fish and saw a fireball come down and a beautiful woman step out of it. Hmm. And he thought it was an angel. Uh, and that was how the story got passed down through our family. And of course, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, that, <laughs> that, that doesn't sound like an angel to me. And so, <laughs> You know, when you go back and, and look at those experiences, and, and to your point, Chris, I'm sure the listeners thought about this too, but, uh, you know, be willing to uh, take in some of the family folklore and decipher it and say, well, you know, did uh, my great-great-grandmother think that she saw an angel or was this house haunted by something else or, or what have you to pull the details out somehow uh, and see if they align? Because sometimes, you know, you have those family folklore histories and things like that that, until you go back and look at the details again, you just accept it as like, oh, yeah, this is the story that my uncle used to tell. And you don't make the connections that are there. And this this also makes me think of the whole genetics connection because it, it might be that we experience certain things certain ways because of our genetics. Mm -hmm. You know, like so someone else having the same experience wouldn't see the same entity. But her, her and her father you know, saw it because their genetics you know, predisposed them to seeing this particular thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it is something that has been, you know, proven in studies to be reproducible that uh, trauma, at least, is handed down genetically. I mean, I think in mice and certain uh, other poor creatures that are being experimented upon. But uh, I would not doubt for a second that the same is 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 true with humans. And maybe there have been studies that have shown that that's true with humans, too. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, just like I was talking earlier about the Banshee, you know, certain family members will see the same Banshee. Yeah. So the, the logical conclusion is, oh, they're seeing a spirit, but what if they're not? What if they're manifesting that as a poltergeist, as poltergeist energy from themselves, but it's manifesting that way because that's, that's what their genetics is, you know, there's some genetic factor that is creating that image, you know? And of course, the other thing that I would want, you know, ask or I, you know, might consider is what was happening in your life at the time that it, this happened to both you and your father in that sort of environment, you know, yeah. was it a st stressful time where your parents fighting, you know, had somebody close to you passed, you know, anything like that. At five, year old, five years old, they may not remember. That is true. You're right. Good point. You're right. Good point. All right. Let's uh let's go on to this next one here. Okay, this came from Sarah. I uh, I love listening to the listener stories on your show because they make me feel like my experiences aren't quite as weird. I figured I'd write in 
since I have some I haven't really heard discussed much. Um, also, sorry, this will be a little bit long. For background, I was raised strictly Christian, believing it less as I grew up, and then chose atheism around the time I was 23 or 24, being unable to accept everything I was taught in church. I am now 30, and I have been drifting back toward a general idea of belief in spiritual stuff. I've had weird experiences since I was very young, including some very weird, vivid dreams. I'm also weird and have a lot of memories from being a kid and don't typically remember and typically remember almost all of my dreams. When we lived in my family's first house, the first weird thing I remember was when I was three. I was sleeping in a toddler bed and what was later my... In my, what was later my brother's room. I heard a knock on the door and woke up and turned to look at the door, expecting it to be my mom or dad. Instead, it was about three or four adult-sized colorful monsters. They looked like they could have been Muppets or that they were wearing a colorful costume. They stood there staring at me, and one made a move to walk into the room. I started screaming and crying, and by the time my mom had rushed into my room, they had vanished. It was probably just a dream, but I include it because I had a similar feel to certain other dreams, nightmares later. My next one, I was probably still about three, but was now in my room, which was one door down and still opening to, into the same hallway. I re remember lying awake in bed, staring at a tiny little bright light flying around my room. I remember saying something, but not what it's, or it saying something, but not what it said. I remember telling my parents it was a shiny little bee flying in my room, and I was told it was a dream, but I distinctly remember being awake. The next experience, I was maybe six. It was a summer evening, very warm and sunny still, and it was just starting to get ready. I was just starting to get ready for bed. I just finished brushing my teeth, stepped out into the same hallway connected to the bedrooms. I looked down the stairs and saw something very weird. It was maybe about four feet tall in the shape of basically a gingerbread cookie man, or gingerbread man cookie, and a, and a pure black, a pure void black but with these beams of light shooting out in full outline around it. I looked down the hallway to see if anyone was there that I could call over to look at it. No one was there, and when I looked back down the stairs, the weird shape was gone too. Next experience, I was still six, maybe seven. I was brushing my teeth again in the same bathroom, facing the mirror, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move at the door. I looked over at it, and past the doorway, I saw this huge, blacker-than-black man walk past the doorway. Despite being pure black with no definition, I saw that he was extremely muscled and so tall that I was only seeing the top half of him sticking up through the door as he walked past, meaning maybe he was 15 feet tall or so. Since I remember he was so tall, I couldn't see the top of his head past the bathroom door frame. I also remember around this time I started having weird nightmares. I had a dream where I was on a snowy hill and I found a cute little bunny which grabbed onto my arm with a vice grip and tried to drag me through a portal to hell. I knew I was dreaming, but it had a very similar feel to the dream with the monsters. I knew something bad would happen if I got dragged into the portal, and I had to genuinely struggle very hard not to get dragged in. Another nightmare I remember had a similar theme. I remember hiding under a chair underneath our kitchen table. The walls of the house were gone, and I was surrounded by a burning forest. A pterodactyl was flying overhead trying to find me, and if I... And I knew if it found me, it would drag me to hell. It only cared about me, though. There was someone sitting on the chair I was hiding under, and somehow them being above me was masking my location from the pterodactyl. Next experience, I was maybe about eight now. I had woken up in the middle of the night and needed the bathroom. I got up, stepped out of my room into the same hallway, and a shape caught my eye. To the right, a couple of feet away, at the end of the hallway, my parents had a large clock hanging from the wall with shelves below it, displaying little antique brass figures of horse clocks and a miniature rotary phone. The shape I saw was a boy about the same size and age, facing, standing facing the clock with a hand outstretched, touching the miniature rotary phone. As soon as I came around the corner, he turned in surprise and he looked at me. He was wearing a red baseball cap, a red t-shirt and blue jeans, had brown hair, he was slightly blurry like he was out of focus, and he looked like he was standing in sunlight despite everything around him being dark uh, from it being nighttime. He vanished after a few moments. My parents had been growing increasingly concerned about me seeing weird things and my hell-focused nightmares and had me both see a psychologist and talking to our minister along with three other, quote, spiritual specialists, not sure who they were 
exactly. I was told to tell them what I'd seen and dreamed and never saw them again afterwards. It was deemed I didn't have anything wrong with me psychologically, so our minister came over and blessed our house and everything subsided. We did move out after that, so I've always wondered if things would have continued happening since everything seemed to be centered around that hallway. I've never seen anything like what I saw in that hallway since, but I've ended up developing extremely vivid, memorable dreams. Some nights I have dreams so complex and detailed and vast, it's like watching a movie, especially since the main character of my dreams is not necessarily me, despite me being in very varying levels of control of them. Also, when I heard you talking about big dreams and little dreams, it was like a shocking epiphany, epiphany to me. I've had some dreams I can tell are just dreams, especially if they have symbolism I can apply to what's going on in my life. I have other dreams that are so bizarre or have such a totally different feeling to them that I just can't accept that my brain is throwing out random information. I have times in my dreams where I can feel others. I don't fully understand it better than that, but it has such a distinct feeling exactly this, exactly like the dream with the monsters when I was really young and the hell bunny and the pterodactyl. It's a feeling almost like sleep paralysis, the feeling of something being there, but me knowing I'm dreaming and me actually being able to interact with them and have influence over the world we're in. Sometimes I'm hiding from the others and sometimes I'm struggling toward a goal fighting against them. Uh, I'm sorry about this being so long. It just feels good to share this. Obviously, my parents knew about the stuff when I was young, but I've never talked to about it since. I had dismissed everything as just dreams, but I never knew how to classify the stuff I saw when I know I was awake. I never had an imaginary friend or anything. I was always clearly knew the fine line between real and imaginary landed, so I had assumed it was hallucinations or something. But listening to your show made me remember these things so clearly, especially the feelings people talk about with them. Yeah, well, the the the, uh, the particular part about, I think it was the pterodactyl and something else that we're going to, the bunny that we're going to drag them to hell, drag her to hell. Yeah. Um, I feel like that, that particular part of it is, sounds to me like a projection of somebody who was raised in a very, um, a religious household. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that that means that these weren't actual things that were happening. Um, uh, I think that that part of it though, uh, to me seems like uh, a projection, but you know, I'd also don't want to, um, uh, <laughs> say anything that, uh, in any way, you know, makes people who do believe in the, uh, uh, traditional hell feel, uh, uh, disenfranchised. Um, right. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't remember if, if Jack Hunter and I talked about it on the air or not, but we had talked about the prevalence of like cartoon characters and things like that showing up in these experiences. Yeah. So, and we've read many stories over the years where people see things that just don't make, you know, like they know they're not real. Cause it's like, Oh, I see yeah. bugs bunny peering over the back wall or yep. uh, the Scooby-Doo gang is following me. And he's, and they're like, I know that's not what it is. Oh yeah. Like I, I, remember coming across a, a story one time from someone who was seeing like Elmo come out of the, their closet to come play with them, you know? Yeah. Uh, that is terrifying. <laughs> um, but it, it is such a recurring experience and it would be interesting to see what age range that happens in. If it's something to do with the, your mind developing, uh, right. It, it, it interpreting experiences in a certain way. Uh, the shadow figures are, those remind me exactly of like the shadow people that my mom and I saw when we were, when we were young, when I was young, Yeah, uh, you know, we would have the shadow figure walk past the, the door to my bedroom, or we would both see it down at the end of the hallway and you look away and look back and it would be gone. Um, we moved out of that house because it bothered us that much. And of course my dad never saw the thing, but my mom and I got bothered by it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a, a pretty ubiquitous experience for a lot of people too um the light in the bedroom the glowing bee yeah um, <laughs> what a how cool is that um <laughs> you know it, it makes me think of like the idea of like a fairy you know in the much more like western disney sense or 
you know, there's also that idea of like uh, drones from a UFO or something like that, you know? I've had one experience where I woke up with a, a shadow on my ceiling. Ooh. Uh, and the thing, and I sat there, I laid there just watching it, going, well, that shouldn't be there. I mean, it was moving along the edges between like the, the ceiling and the wall. Mm -hmm. And I watched it for a while before I eventually fell back asleep. I mean, I was completely awake watching this because I'm going, you know, because I'm thinking, is this hypnagogic? And so I woke myself up as much as I could, and I'm watching it going, nope, not hypnagogic. I'm watching a shadow move along my wall. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I was asleep. It was during the day. So, I mean, the room yeah. was the room was only slightly dim, but the shadow was like liquid. I always call it liquid darkness. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. And then there was the experience where me, my girlfriend at the time, and another friend were walking through the, the graveyard in Ithaca, and we were surrounded by little little blips of light, almost like insects. And uh, she saw it, and I saw it, but the other friend we were with saw nothing. Oh, I remember you telling me that when we were there. Yeah. 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 You know, that's a quite a reversal from the other end of like flies all around you too, by the way. <laughs> True. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, because that, that was a really amazing experience. I mean, because we were just surrounded by these colored lights. Mm -hmm. And it just, it felt completely <laughs> surreal. But the fact that we were both seeing it means it wasn't just a basic hallucination. Right. I mean, again, I think it's this. It's these overlays, you know, it's like everything's going on uh, all around us. We're just, you know, we can't necessarily, we're not necessarily conscious of it. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes and I don't just mean like UV rays. I think it probably is a little bit more, you know, complicated, not UV rays, but I don't just mean like visible light spectrum, non-visible light spectrum, though I do mm -hmm. think, as we've talked about before, that definitely could be part of it. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's a much more complicated, maybe something beyond what we can comprehend in terms of physics. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all around us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, I got. Uh, I don't know if, if I have anything more to say about that. The dream thing is important. I mean, I don't. I think people dismiss dreams as being nonsense, and that's sort of a Western thing. Yeah. And I don't think dream. I mean, so, yes, some dreams are nonsense. Some dreams are subconscious dumps of information that you're stressed out about or whatever. But even so, they're also telling you what you're stressed out about. Um, but I think there's plenty that goes on in dreams, and, it, and it's more. Like big dream and little dream is is you know something that I I find interesting, but I think there's so many different levels there too because you have the lucid dream, you have sleep paralysis, and like what I experience isn't exactly sleep paralysis because I'm not like awake and unable to move. It's more like a lucid dream I can't get out of when I have that experience, or it something will happen as soon as I lay down. So I haven't had time to go to fall asleep yet. But it is in that liminal state of, okay, I've just laid down to go to sleep, and immediately, you know, something drops down on the bed behind me, and like I'll, and I can't move. So the paralysis thing is there, but these are all different variations of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then you have prophetic dreams and things like that. So I don't know. There's just a lot going on with dreams that we, we tend not to pay attention to. Well, I think that, yeah, it's not just big dream and little dream. Like you said, it's the, the, the myriad nature of it and it's what you can pull out of it. And I think, I do think that you can, you know, as many people have discussed, train yourself and we've seen talk, you've talked to people who, you know, have done dream training and stuff like that, training themselves to, you know, uh, uh control their dreams and work through their dreams in a, in, in a better way. Um, but it does take, I mean, I th I do think it's, it does take work. Like if you want to suss out what is something that's meaningful to you or that's helpful to you from sort of the noise, um, uh, it, it can be very, very uh, powerful again in terms of, you know, non-traditional ways of, uh, trans of uh, self-transformation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow. I still have a ton of these left. I thought we were going to get through most of them. Um, I got time for maybe one short one here. I was seven or eight years old, and I was on my way home from primary school. There was no such thing as someone collecting you back then. It was in like 1968 or 69. 
it wasn't too, I wasn't too far from home, and there were plenty of other children walking my route. I was, it was just after 3 p.m. and a normal sunny afternoon. As I put my hand on the handle of the doorhouse, I suddenly got the strangest feeling of apprehension and nervousness. I couldn't understand what it was that was so different. I ran into the kitchen and threw my bag on the floor and bounced in to greet my mother. To my surprise, there was a round table where there had never been a table before, and sitting around it were my mother, father, and brother. It took me a second or two to realize that neither my father or brother should be home, my father being at work and my brother not home from school until much later as he was older than me and at secondary school. As I apprehensively went to approach them and ask what was happening and why were my dad and brother there, I noticed that the air surrounding the table was shimmering, the air sparkling, moving, and pixelating. I now associate that kind of atmosphere like that of a heat haze. I noticed, too, that they were, they were sitting so very still, not a movement, staring straight ahead into nothingness like waxwork models. I was then totally overcome with the certainty that I should not approach them or touch them. I knew instinctively that if I touched them, they would crumble to dust. I don't know why I was so sure of this, but I just knew to keep away from them. I can't remember how this situation resolved itself, and try as I might, no memory of, of how the afternoon ended comes to me. To be honest, I didn't even remember this event until listening to your episode of Where Did the Road Go, where a listener named David McCallum was a guest on your show, February 9th, 2019, about 38 minutes in, who had a similar shimmery experience in his home with his sister. When I heard that episode, the memory of that day came flooding back as if it was yesterday. The memories of the absolute terror I felt as a child flooded back like a wave, and the terror of the feeling I got that if I had touched my folks, they would, would have crumbled and I'd never see them again. Of course, since then, I've given my experience a lot of thought, and I've convinced it did indeed happen because of the effect remembering it, it has had on me, and every detail and color of the scene is now as vivid as any memory from yesterday. But try as I might, I can't remember how the scenario ended. Coincidentally, this experience happened at my home in the north of Scotland, and strangely, David was living in Scotland, too, at the time of his shimmering experience. Oh, that's really interesting that David was living there at the same time, huh? Yeah, same area. Yeah. yeah. Same area. Maybe, Scot maybe northern Scotland has, you know, a shimmering issue. Yeah, right. Well, it's the 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 image that it brings to mind uh, for me immediately is the uh, end of the that uh, the great Terry Gilliam film Time Bandits, where uh, spoilers. Uh, it's from the eighties. You, you can deal with spoilers for it. Yeah. When uh, the protagonist, this kid who's been sort of traveling through time and space with uh, these um, essentially angels, these uh, uh, <laughs> all these uh, 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 all these. Uh, dwarves that are playing um, uh, essentially the the helpers of God that created the universe. Anyway, it's a pretty funny film. Monty Python, Terry Gilliam won't go into the whole thing, but he gets in, in the very end and he arrives back at his sort of, you know, suburban house, suburban family um, in the middle of suburban London. And they're all sort of frozen like that. And when he touches them, they all uh, they crumble to dust uh, huh. at the very end. Yeah. Interesting. This this, oh, interesting. this would have happened way before that. Right. Um, you know, go ahead, Sarah. I, I would almost say that it has some kind of time thing, like if, if uh, you know, later, it, it, like if it was their normal table, she saw them sitting around, and then, you know, it could have been a, a time slip type of a situation where she was perceiving it from another time period, but the table was never there, you know? So... Let me throw this out uh, to add to that. You know, uh, you and I talked about other timelines and things like that. Sometimes I wonder if things bleed across instead mm. of back. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I certainly wouldn't want to touch something that uh, wasn't exactly supposed to be here. Um, just thinking in terms of matter and antimatter and whatever else. <laughs> I, I don't right. know. But if yeah. I saw that, I would probably be like, ah, I'm not touching this. Right. Um, and, and you hear sometimes of people that have encountered time slips where there, there's a certain like I'm not supposed to be here. If I interact with anything, yeah, what's going to happen? Uh, who knows if you get stuck? Because if people got stuck, we haven't heard about it. Yeah, yeah, they <clears throat> they've just disappeared. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, it it sounds though it almost it sounds to me as if she was like stuck in time though, or if it was. Or her family was. It sounded to me from the way that you described it 
that they were almost like frozen there um, and like a stasis field or something like that. You know, the shimmering yeah. makes me think of, again, I'm the filmmaker, so I'll make all of these media TV uh, film references. You know, it makes me think of, you know, uh, like Star Trek, um, uh, you know, force field, um, a stasis field. Type right, thing. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, like I said, the only problem with any of that is that, I mean, the, other, the alternate dimension thing might work, but there was, you know, it's a table she'd never seen before. Right, right, right. You know, so like I said, if it, it had been her normal kitchen table that they were around, I'd say, well, maybe it's a time slip or she's right. receiving some piece of information about that table or whatever, but the table didn't exist. So where did the table come right. from? But an alternate so timeline might explain that. Alternate timeline, yeah. So she doesn't remember it either. So that makes me think that uh, what did the, uh, like the, the time cops, the time police came in, gave her like a, <laughs> one of those like, BP I I hypnot- hypnosis that's men in black I'm thinking of yes, somehow you know yeah. whatever gaster or something to something like that well right, it, right. I, I think too you know these things probably happen in a slightly altered state of consciousness that we don't always remember you know just like a dream yes. we don't always remember yes you know, very much so dream you know you may wake up going oh I'm not going to forget that dream and two minutes later you're like what was the dream again oh completely <laughs> yeah and I know plenty of people who don't remember their dreams ever and yeah. you know they're dreaming because everyone dreams it's just it's a different level of consciousness uh, my wife and I have that discussion a lot because she does not remember any of her dreams and I probably <laughs> every morning I'm like man that was an awesome dream I had last night you know <laughs> Uh, all right, so we are just about out of time. Uh, hey, Chris, where can people find you in your movies? Uh, you can go to uh, brightrectangle.com or thehillandthehole.com. We have Blu-rays uh, that are Ooh. almost sold out, special edition Blu-rays. And uh, besides that, you can stream it on Amazon. Now, is, is it uh, free with Prime still? Still free with, uh, oh, it might not be. That might have expired. Oh, okay. I think it's, it's for rental, though. It's a cheap rental. Um, and it's worth it. It's two ninety nine, or you can get the special Blu ray, which is a very, very nice, professionally done Blu ray with Beautiful. a barcode and everything. Uh huh. If you go to the hill in the hole dot com. And uh, is Corpse still available? Corpse is still available. That's for free, and we should have Blu rays for that that are available. Blu ray DVD. I will say this is combo pack. Oh. Um, uh, soon. Yes, for that as well. And I think we're going to put some of our backlog of, uh, you know, weird underground films from the past 10 years uh, up on the Amazon uh, Bright Rectangle uh, uh, Prime site for free view soon, too. So that should be coming up. That'll be cool. I haven't seen those. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Soraya, Chris, thanks, guys. I enjoyed it. I want to take a moment to thank all of my patrons. Without you, this show would not be possible. And I want to give an extra special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Super Inframan, Allison Cook, Eric Hervin, Tim, Joel Thomas Runyon, Empty K, Nagatha Christie, Dorkimus Prime, Patricia W., Barbara Fisher, Will Powell, Big Boy Limina, Craig Parmenter, Walker, Joanna Rojas, Maddie, David Moore, Vincent Trewell, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Becky Trainer, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Edu Camahort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Taylor, Sam Sharon, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster III, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Sejder, Dominic O'Malley, Riker and Stark, J. Otto Bullet, Jose A., Charles Davis, Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cisternos, Ray Benedetto, Linz Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Matthew Sproul, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Carla Mahoney, and James Lattimore. Thank you all so very much. I hope you enjoyed this listener story edition of Where Did the Road Go? There is a Patreon extra where we talk about some other stuff, not listener stories, but uh, Super Inframan, myself, and Chris kind of have an open conversation that'll be up for patrons later in the week. If you want to become a Patreon, it's only $3 a month and it helps us out greatly to continue the show. And you can do that at where did the road go.com or you can go to patreon.com slash Soraya Azkath, S E R I A H A Z K A T H. But there is a link right on where did the road go.com, which is probably the easier way to do it. And I try to give you extra content all month long. The last show with Nathan Isaac 
the Patreon segment ended up being longer than the actual show. If you have a story, something you've experienced, um, you can contact me at stories at wheredotheroadgo.com. Even if it's something you don't want to share on the air and you just want to get off your chest or ask me about, you can send it there. You can contact me in general at contact at wheredotheroadgo.com. If you are in an independent band or you're an independent artist and you'd like your song or songs featured on the end of Where Did the Road Go, contact at wheredotheroadgo.com is the way to do that. Now, 2020 was a hell of a year, and uh, hopefully this year things will improve, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen overnight. So thank you for everyone who has stuck with me over the last year. So here's hoping that things take an upward swing going forwards. I'm also considering starting a Discord. So if there's anyone out there who would uh, like to be involved with helping me set that up, I'm not all that familiar with Discord, uh, drop me a line. Contact at wheredotheroadgo.com if you're interested in you know getting involved in that. And if a Discord sounds like something you'd be interested in just joining, let me know so I know there's some interest in this. As I said, I'm a little new to Discord, but I know a lot of people seem to really like it. So we're going to give that a shot. And I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. 